Hi, yeah, I'm Holger. Um, I've been looking into both the theoretical and practical aspects of federated learning for the last several years uh, working at NVIDIA. And um, today the topic is around empowering federated learning for massive models with uh, NVIDIA Flare. So there's a focus on the large language modeling. So let's give some background about this topic. Um, one thing to um, build generalizable and robust AI models uh, is data. Data is the key to achieve state-of-the-art models. And there are several cha challenges, um, starting from the data preparation to um, paucity, which um, refers to the fact that a lot of the important data, like rare uh, inform rare samples for certain uh, rare conditions are uh, um, sparsely distributed or siloed in, in data sets can often not be uh, centralized because of privacy um, considerations or concerns. So um, a solution for this is uh, federated learning, right? So we, we here, we, we show federated analysis as a precursor to the learning and then federated training as a way to to learn from these sparsely distributed data sets, always by keeping privacy in mind. Um, there are several also legal restrictions around, around data, right? First, starting from some uh, regulations in, uh, for example, in, in the EU and in China that really um, make it difficult to share data sets. Um, and and these these have been recently announced in order to pre prevent um, privacy le uh, data privacy leaks leaks. So um, and sometimes it's it's just not even feasible to um, share the data just because of the, the huge quantity of data sets. The copying data is like a, a, a practical hurdle for some projects, right? Especially looking again at um, large language modeling where, the data sets can be massive. Um, so the solution for this is really um, so-called federated learning, where we now share models and not the data. So here's an example of a healthcare application where different hospitals don't need to uh, share private data. They can keep the, the governance of the data sets. The data is also, you know, um, a treasure trove, like something uh, uh, intellectual property is assigned to the data. So sharing that is, uh, if it's even if it's possible through regulations, a lot of companies or institutions don't want to share the raw data because they, they they see a lot of value in it. So sharing models allows them to collaborate um, in order to achieve more powerful and generalizable models. So in the simplest uh, scenario, this is uh, something called federated averaging. So here we would uh, typically start with a centralized server um, that is initializing a global model. These mo this uh, model is then distributed to different participating clients that have um, data sets either on prem or in a, in a private cloud uh, for training. And uh, once they receive the current global model, they train locally uh, for a certain amount of time and uh, send back a model update. And typically it's a delta weights um, that are sent back to the server and the server then can do an, an weighted aggregation, typically taking into account some um, factors about the data distributions like uh, the, the size of the data or some measurement for importance of updates from certain clients to um, update the global model. And then this is sent back and iterated um, until convergence. And then um, in order, so now you could say like, okay, but I, I might still be leaking some private information right through these model updates. So there are additional techniques like um, encryption or differential privacy that can be applied here in order to make sure that no pri private data is being leaked out, um, even through sharing the model information. Um, so at NVIDIA, we have been building a, a, a framework agnostic solution for implementing this, these kind of federated data analytics uh, workflows called NVIDIA Flare. Um, it's 
agnostic to different industries so you can you can combine it with many um solutions from uh, from starting from healthcare to finance autonomous driving and uh all kinds of uh, applications it's very flexible in that uh, case and it uh, provides you with a set of privacy preserving algorithms workflows and uh, basically acts as a runtime environment for your federated learning uh, scenario and uh, in order to do this in the real world right we have to take uh, security very seriously and um we recognize that security is multi-layered, so there are several layers of um, security measures, starting from uh, user identity the checks, from communication security, individual um, user policies that uh, uh, can be enforced, and then in all combined with the privacy preservation algorithms. Everything is available on GitHub as open source. All the development is done open source. Um, uh, under Apache 2 license. So uh, you can utilize that in your um, commercial applications and in your in your projects um, pretty much without many res uh, restrictions. Um, there are tools for simulation and real world deployment. And um, as I said, it's very flexible. You can implement all kinds of uh, communication patterns. Here are a couple of highlights. We have integrations with uh, popular uh, training frameworks, like starting from PyTorch, TensorFlow, but also XGBoost and more classical machine learning uh, libraries like uh, SkyGet Sky, uh, Learn for um, dealing with tabular data. Um, what we also see are different da data partitioning scenarios, right? So you can think about a so-called horizontal federated learning where um, each data owner has a, a similar set of features that, uh, but a unique, a typically unique um, user base. So um, you can do this, this federated averaging I talked about. But there are also scenarios like a vertical federated learning where you might have an overlap in, in, the, in the user base, but each data, uh, data owner has a different set of features that can somehow be combined in order to have more powerful predictive models. So that's then uh, techniques like uh, split learning, or we have a virtu vertical XGBoost XG version that can be applied in these scenarios. And then um, maybe more the focus of this talk is going to be type of hacking phase and uh, NVIDIA NEMO, uh, natural language processing networks around the large uh, language modeling. But that's give you another high level overview of N NVIDIA Flare. So uh, the, the principal component that allows you to implement all kinds of workflows in NVIDIA Flare is this so-called, uh, this, this, this work, workflow architecture, right? So we, we, we typically run a controller on the server that can assign tasks um, to uh, all the clients or maybe a subset or individual clients. Um, and the clients act as dummy compute um, machines, basically, that can execute a task and send back a result. Um, and then the server, in the case of federated averaging, it would be doing this global model aggregation to update a global model and send back an updated result for the, as the, as the next task. But you can see that this is a very general architecture. So all kinds of tasks can be assigned and all, all kinds of computations can be done on, on the clients, right? And then um, having this, this privacy focus in mind, we can always ap apply and also enforce um, certain filters that are being applied to the incoming data to, for example, detect any malicious type of models that might be contained in this. Um, or uh, we can filter, apply uh, uh, encryption filters or differential privacy or some data leakage detection filters before sending anything out from the clients. So uh, the right-hand side is uh, making this point that each organization, you know, each client could be owned by a different organization, can enforce um, different levels of privacy filters um, before or when participating in this kind of federation. 
there are several um, companies and institutions that are uh, applying NVIDIA Flare in, in real world production. And um, I'm listing a few here. They have mostly healthcare and financial services uh, are um, kind of a major focus. We also do um, research with NV NVIDIA Flare. So um, there are a couple of recent works uh, listed here. Um, one thing is uh, auto ML. Um, you can imagine that now that each client can train their model locally, you could have, um, you basically have a larger set of hyperparameters that can be optimized, right? Each uh, local learning rate could be adjusted for each client to make it more optimal. So that becomes a larger set of hyperparameters that can be automatically um, optimized as well. So um, here we use a reinforcement uh, learning technique to find the best um, like uh, the best hyperparameters, uh, for example, the aggregation rates um, during the training. So you can see that here, the the weights are kind of evolving during the training while the model is learning which client gives uh, the, the best information or the most useful uh, information for the overall performance. Then uh, we have some work on the privacy preservation, like how feasible is this actually to reconstruct any information from these model updates when they're sent back to the server. Um, and uh, yeah, this, is, this, this paper is actually trying to attack these gradients with a, a gradient inversion technique um, to see how much information it can get out of it. And it, it turns out to be quite challenging to get reason, uh, like anything useful out of it um, in, in, in realistic scenarios. So um, another imp uh, interesting aspect is how do you quantify how important are the different clients, right? Uh, there could be like, you, just the size of the data is of course not enough, right? You could have a lot of redundant data samples in your in your data set. So um, having something more sophisticated to estimate the contribution of, of uh, different clients' data sets, it's gonna be useful. Um, even thinking down the road for some sort of compensation schemes, right? For providing data sets to these joint collaborations. Um, and then personalization. Of course, we have a lot of uh, possibilities here to train models that are working on the glo uh, best on the global level, but also uh, personalized for each of the client's uh, data distributions. Okay, so with that, I I'd like to move on to um, the large language models topic, which is something we've been working on for the last year or so um, to really um, make it feasible to train large language models in a federated learning scenario. And uh, in AI in general, I, I guess everyone is aware that large language models have been dominating the news, right? Uh, there has been a explosion of different types of architectures over the last couple of years, um, both open source and closed source uh, solutions. But uh, you can, from this recent survey paper, you can probably see some sort of trend towards the GPT style um, trans transformer-based models um, uh, that, you know, just scaled up larger and larger to um, perform more complex and uh, more tasks more reliably. So then the question is like, why, why do we need federated learning for large language models? And it's it's pretty much the same uh, motivations that I already explained, right? Also for language models, um, especially when you wanna adapt them to uh, some downstream tasks, you might not have the data, uh, but it might not be possible to centralize the data or um, uh, data owners wanna keep their private IP Right, so they don't want to share the data. So um, federated learning solutions are still relevant, and uh, what we see is typically, uh, um, even though these pre-trained LLMs are very powerful general knowledge um, type networks, 
um, when you want to adapt them to downstream tasks, um, it's it's still the fact that the larger, the more data, more diverse data you have for training, um, gives you better. Ultimately, it gives you better models. And again, we have these 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 um, separate techniques that allow you to do all kinds of interesting research or personalization of the models. Um, also with regard to uh, federated inference or evaluation of the models. So we have looked at, um, let's say, three kinds of use cases or applications for large language modeling uh, models in NVFlare. One is the parameter efficient fine tuning, which is, um, I think, a, a very interesting technique because it, it's kind of as the name indicates it's efficient uh, and allows you to to adapt the, your models to downstream tasks then we have supervised fine-tuning which requires more compute but for, most likely can achieve more powerful models and then we have interesting applications outside of the the natural language processing um, also in biopharma applications like uh, protein sequences and things uh, analysis uh, analyzing of protein sequences so for the for the the idea behind the parameter efficient fine tuning is that uh, you keep most of your uh, large language model layers fixed so you keep this these foundational models you can take one of off the shelf pre trained model that's maybe pre-trained on all publicly available uh, textual data sets, right? So these are very powerful general purpose models, but they typically, or they, they might not work well for your downstream task, right? So if you have a, 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 a downstream data set, let's say a sentiment analysis, then you can use that to supervise the, um, supervise the adaptation of the, this large language model to the downstream task. There are several techniques like prompt tuning, p-tuning, adapters, LoRa, and others uh, that have been proposed. And um, we have, implement, we have uh, implemented several examples using like different size base models. So you, you can start from a few hundred megabyte, uh, uh, sorry, few hundred million parameter models to up to 20 billion um, parameter model that's provided by NEMO, which is NVIDIA's uh, uh, language modeling uh, SDK. So for this prompt learning, the idea is pretty simple, right? So you can imagine, I assume everyone is familiar with these kind of chat GPT style models, right? If you have played around with the interface of ChatGPT, you can you can put in uh, typically manually. You can put in something like answer the question, and then put in uh, an input text, which is the actual question of part, which would be in this case part of your uh, data set. Um, so, in instead of doing this manually, the so-called prompt engineering, you can also do this um, automatically using gradient-based optimization. Right, so instead of having a, a manual typed in prompt, we um, take some tokens and we optimize the values of these tokens to um, to condition the model to give you the, the desired um, output for this, this type of question. So one example we looked at is a sentiment analysis for a, um, a financial task. So, this uh, data set contains um, financial news headlines, and the, the task is to predict if this is like a positive, a negative, or neutral uh, headline. So um, we can actually structure the data set in this kind of fashion. We say, this is the headline, um, and then we put in this kind of placeholder token sentiment and uh, the prediction of the <laughs> large language model. So utilizing this, we can we can take the pre-trained model, and we can only uh, we can optimize these this uh, these virtual tokens using a prompt encoder network. So this prompt encoder network is very lightweight, um, sometimes based on LSTM or just a, a multi-layer perceptron, 
um, that predicts the value of these tokens, uh, while the, the large language model itself stays fixed on each of the clients here. So there, therefore, we also have to we, we don't have to communicate uh, the full model, right? We only communicate the parameters of this prompt encoder to update the global prompt encoder. And in NVIDIA Flare, this is actually really easy to do. Like uh, framework, uh, popular frameworks like Nemo, they use PyTorch Lightning uh, as the training script or to write the training scripts. And in NVIDIA Flare, we um, implemented uh, a client API that allows you to to patch the PyTorch Lightning trainer, right? So the, the, what the patching is doing is that it adds additional callbacks to the trainer. One is in the in the beginning of the training, it will receive the global model from the server, update the model inside your trainer, and then at the end of training, it will um, send back the, the model updates, like the, the, the differences of the local training. So this is done um, automatically for you in this in this patch function. And then we, we add this while flares running loop in order to um, kind of utilize the same uh, data loaders and stuff that are initialized here in the beginning of the script. So each this this loop is basically executed at each round of uh, local training. And then here's some quantitative results. We, uh, we use the 20 billion Megatron uh, pre-trained model from Nemo. And um, the prompt encoder only has 50 million parameters in this case. So it's uh, it's like less than a percent of the original data uh, model size that is being updated. And uh, in this case, you can see that uh, the central training, assuming all the data can be centralized, and the federated learning is, is pretty close to each other. And if we assume that data sets cannot be centralized, each client can only train on their locally available data, then we really see a, a benefit for the global model where all of them are jointly training and they, they can get a more robust um, generalizable model. And as I mentioned, there, there are several techniques that allow um, different techniques that can do this uh, kind of parameter efficient fine tuning. Each of them has like different um, pros and cons. Like the adapters adding additional layers in, in inserting additional layers, uh, adaptation layers inside the LLM. So it is a bit more uh, time consuming to, tr to train. And the low rank ad adaptation is adding kind of an adaptive. Uh, low rank representation of the large language model um, parameters to to adapt it to the downstream task. So um, in the literature, they have to be shown quite effective compared to like a full fine tuning while being much more parameter efficient. And uh, Nemo implements a whole bunch of them. So you can you can basically just with one line change in the configuration file, switch between different techniques and then because we use this patch function on the NV flare side, nothing has to be changed. You can just run uh, these different techniques um, out of the off the shelf, basically. So here is an example that compares these different types of um, parameter efficient fine tuning techniques. And as I said, adapter is a, a, a takes more time to train just because there are many layers and you need to run like inference and back propagate, uh, propagation to these adaptation layers while LoRa is a bit more efficient. Uh, and then, yeah, they achieve a, a comparable performance but outperform the P-tuning in all of these cases. Yeah, here, a smaller model. Um, in this case, use case, you can see that if you use the big 20 billion parameter pre-trained model, as your base, then you know with very short amount of adaptation, like uh, fed, uh, only a few rounds of federated learning, you can achieve, um, yeah, a, a accuracy close to one. So um, that's where another indication that you know the large scale, large language models really are useful for um, for solving different downstream tasks. Okay, so with that. Um, 
I go to the next topic, which is the supervised fine tuning, which um, again, I think parameter efficient fine tuning is great, but it cannot address all challenges, right? If you really want to build the next chat GPT, you probably need to do some full uh, fine tuning of the model. It's uh, it's typically one of the, the steps that is done to train um, a kind of a chat GPT tile, tile uh, uh, ChatGPT type uh, a large language model. You would would basically have uh, different um, training uh, training steps, right? You have the supervised fine tuning, but then uh, you also want to do the reinforcement learning with the human in the loop type approaches to <laughs> to ground your model um, towards your use case. So here we are really focusing on this one key step in this training uh, paradigm, which is the supervised fine tuning. So now in, in, in NVIDIA Flare, we 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 need to communicate the entire param uh, set of parameters, uh, which can be several tens, sometimes hundreds of uh, gigabyte of data, um, even with quantization. So even when trying to reduce the precision of the, the parameters, um, it can be a, a large, it's a large message that needs to be transmitted at every round of federated learning. So I would say NVIDIA Flare is one of the first frameworks that can impl implement a reliable large object streaming uh, yeah, transport layer that um, allows us to do this in the real world. So the way we implemented this is to um, split the message into one megabyte um, chunks, which are then streamed over the network. And uh, you know there's like some fail safe built in to make sure that the entire message can be reconstructed on the receiving side um, without any data loss. Um, in our examples, we have actually two frameworks that are showing shown an example for supervised fine tuning. One is the Nemo framework by NVIDIA, and then also we have Hacking Face um, example that implement that uses the Hacking Face trainer, which is not based on uh, PyTorch Lightning. So there we cannot use the patch function di directly, but we will probably write something similar uh, in the near future. But uh, Hugging Face um, is an open source um, framework for training large language models. So you can you can also use their implementations directly. Uh, the data set is a combination of public um, available data sets, mostly around the um, instruction following data. So it's kind of the chat style model that you want to train. And we, we assume that each client has one of these data sets. And um, in this, um, so now the, these large models, um, typically people don't even run validation or com a compute computation of some accuracy score because these are kind of open-ended questions. So we, we only look at the, the training loss here. And we can see, um, the, the losses, we can achieve like lower losses using the, the federated learning um, when 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 we learned from all the three data sets combined. To actually evaluate this model then on um, we, what people use is this called, so called zero shot evaluation on different downstream tasks. So, um we can we we're looking at different metrics here which are from um some some combination of different uh, benchmarks uh I, the... yeah i think this is like a subset they're like you know, they're larger evaluation benchmarks even with more different ta types of uh tasks but these are basically all zero shot setting and then you can see here, um, on on average, we achieved the the best performance by using the federated learning. 
expresses all the base models and the um, individually trained models on each of each individual data set perform not as well on average. So the same is also available in Llama 2. So there can we, you can go up to 70 billion parameter model um, using using their implementation. Again, uh, here we, we show like uh, and with the hacking phase um, implementation, it's actually also nice that you can split, you can switch between parameter efficient fine tuning and fully supervised fine tuning um, just with a configuration change. And um, but that will impact your, of course, the size of the model that it needs to be transmitted. So behind the scenes, Enriflare will will support um, both scenarios, right, and will automatically do the streaming for you um, when you have when you have the larger model. Okay, so finally, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the applications uh, in BioPharma we have been exploring so far. So here, there's a, another interesting uh, SDK from NVIDIA, which is applying large language modeling to um, uh, yeah, to biopharma applications. There, there are different techniques here in this SDK. Actually, um, BioNemo uh, includes like a set of different models, which, you know, starting from Mega Moldbard to the ESM type models, which are basically uh, BERT based um, architectures to Pro5. Uh, so uh, this is like the the folding, um, you know, alpha fold type models where you can do um, protein folding predictions. Um, and we can do what we have mostly looked at is this, these ESM1 models now in the federated learning use case where you can predict certain uh, attributes of protein sequences, such as the developability um, or you know, certain properties uh, that are useful for the drug discovery process. Um, one, ch one challenge here is that you, you, you need to fine tune these models and um, from a, a general purpose pre-trained protein sequence model to uh, again, your downstream task. So here we, we, we looked at different learning rates for the, the pre-trained encoder part of the model and your downstream classification part, um, showing that if you do some fine tuning with um, different, with a lower learning rate of the encoder, we, we can achieve a, a, a higher performance here compared to keeping the, the model, uh, the encoder frozen. And um, if, you, if you choose a too high learning rate, then you might run into uh, overfitting but in this in this use case it's it's actually pretty useful because you can um, imagine that each each uh, client can have <coughs> different downstream tasks where, because in uh, in the biopharma scenario we often have different types of so-called endpoints uh, for each of the, uh, the clients um, they might have the same they might have the same uh, protein sequence but uh, a different measurement is associ associated to that um, to that sequence. So those downstream classification models can typically not be uh, averaged, uh, while maybe this joint encoder can be averaged. So here we we want we want to be able to do some sort of multitask setting where each um, encoder can. Uh, can be optimized um, on the clients, and then the, the the model can be shared while the, they keep their own private um, downstream task classification models. Um, another example is this uh, subcellular location prediction, where um, you each you basically want to predict in which part of the cell the protein sequence is uh, coming from. 
Um, so it becomes a very classical classification task. Uh, we, we can simulate some data heterogeneity among the clients. Uh, typically, they, they have sequences uh, only for like a subset of um, these uh, different locations. So this gives you a very realistic distribution to do some research. And then again, we can we can show that um, by combine by jointly learning from all the data sets, we can achieve a better performance compared to uh, each of the, the data owners training only locally. Okay, with that, I think I'm also close on time. So I, I just wanna give a, a quick summary of NVIDIA Flare. Um, it is a, a general federated computing framework, so we can do things like uh, starting from federated data analysis to um, training to federated evaluation and inference, um, uh, all kinds of e even uh, federated monitoring of certain devices could be could be implemented using NVIDIA Flare. So it's built for productivity. We have several security and privacy features. Um, you can do concurrent job execution and scale it um, in, in, in your application. It's very customi customizable. We can um, easily integrate with third-party infrastructure. Um, it's robust for production uh, scale deployment. And we have, I, today I only talked about a small subset of um, examples that we have in the repository, there are many more applications from um, healthcare, medical imaging, uh, finance, fraud detection, just to name a few. And uh, we have growing applications like this. Uh, federate learning is becoming to be um, a very, uh, very important technique in, in several industries, going from medical imaging, medical, medical devices to uh, financial services and so on. So um, I already shared the paper in uh, the chat, but there are also links here to the GitHub and documentation if you're interested. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Holger. So um, if you have questions, I probably only have a very like a limited time for the question. Sorry, the uh, but uh, there's a question I uh, posted. So what's the reasonable number of rounds of learning? Given the resource time and uh, resource uh, constraints, I mean that that really depends on the data set and uh, the model architecture that you're using. Um, also, the technique, right? Are we talking about a parameter efficient fine tuning or fully supervised fine tuning? Um, typically, we're talking about less than like if at most a few hundred rounds, in my experience so far. But um, typically, you know, there, there's also some sort of trade-off, right? Because if you if you send updates too often, then it becomes this um, not federated averaging, but um, what is it? people actually call that federated um, stochastic gradient descent. So it, it's really you could in the extreme, right? You can update the model at each iter uh, local iteration of uh, like each mini batch, but um, that has actually some privacy concerns associated with it. So um, also it's inefficient. So the federated averaging assumes that you train for a longer time, several iterations over larger mini batches um, on your local data. And uh, therefore you can reduce the number of uh, communications to yeah, a few dozens to a few, uh, to a few hundreds, depending on the application. Cool. Uh, any other questions uh, in the audience? If you want, just uh, you can either post on the chat or just uh, unmute yourself and then directly ask. Okay, if not, you know, I'd like to thank Hoger, and I want to pull a plug, uh, you know, uh, plug something as well. So I'm Hoger. You can, if you're interested in the MA Flare, you can directly reach the Hoger. Uh, you can also reach out to me. I'm happen to be the engineer manager and acting product manager for this project. Uh, so next, we're going to turn to Jason. Thank you. Thank you, Holger. Yeah. Jason going to present 
also on large banking models. So I will let Jason to, uh, you know, uh, to share his screen and talk about the, the topic. Great. Yeah. Um, so I'm coming at it from a different angle. Uh, uh, basically, we, you could think of us as a, a applying la large language models um, on the on top. We build application on top of it. Um, so I just pu recently published this paper called uh, Metacognition is All You Need, Using introspective, uh, Introspection and Generative Agents to Improve Goal-Directed Behavior. And essentially, you can think of it as uh, uh, we built a... Uh, we built a simulation, a very basic simulation engine, and we gave agents the ability to um, uh, think. We gave them a cognitive models, a cognitive functions um, that uh, mimic. Uh, I don't know if you, if you've read the book uh, "Thinking Fast and uh, Fast and Slow," um, but that book basically outlined, um, you know, a, 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 a thinking process that essentially said the brain is made up of two different high-level components: system one and system two. System one being, um, you know, a uh, fast, fast thinking, um, you know, uh, very quick doing math, such as like uh, fast math, like uh, you know, a quick addition, driving, anything that's that you're not you're not conscious of, a subconscious, and then conscious thinking. System two, where you know you're doing like hard problems, uh, trying to solve bigger problems, where you're kind of like really co uh, consciously thinking about things, and so. Um, what it, so metacognition really? What is metacognition? Basically, uh, you know, it's a very high level framework. Um, but metacognition is the ability to kind of, um, as I was just saying, you know, the system two thinking of of uh, evaluating yourself. Why am I? Why am I doing the things I'm doing? Um, how am I doing? Um, how can I do better? It's uh, uh, you know, in in cognitive science, uh, in cognitive science research, a lot of people believe that. Um, metacognition is one of the main abilities that a, a human can do versus versus uh you know non non-humans or non-intelligent animals um you know we have the ability to to number one speak and communicate but then we can also direct our thoughts to think about thinking so metacognition really is you know thinking about thinking um and so basically we want to see well with with large language models can we um can we attach um can we attach this kind of metacognition framework and and allow the agent to think about thinking? Um, now, as you can see from this graph here, you know, metacognition can mean multiple different things, right? You can, you can think about your thoughts, you can think about your feelings, your awareness, et cetera. Um, we really focus it on um, goal, task-oriented um, metacognition. And so what does that mean? Essentially, uh, you know, it means, uh, how am I doing on my task? Can I can I do better on my task? And so, this framework we built out in the simulation, um, the agents as they're progressing through the world, they can ask themselves, you know, uh, what is my goal? Do I need to change my goal? Do I need to change my strategy um, to to improve my goal? And so, yeah, uh, the module we basically wrote this all open source. It's multiple components. So if you know, thinking about the components here. Um, uh, this is just some, yeah. So it's it's we we built this completely with local LLMs. So typically, you know, most of the models people are running, um, you know, in not most of the models, but uh, oftentimes you, we're hearing about uh, ChatGPT and the GPT three, five, and four. Um, we did all of our experimentations um, with local models, specifically. Um, we did we tried with many models, but uh, Mistral, Mixtral. Um, we also experimented with other models such as uh, Microsoft Phi, um, uh, several other ones, um, and so yeah. But we're, we we wrote it to to be local LM first uh, because the cost to run our our experiments uh, just for a single run of a simulation, uh, you know, could be if you're using ChatGPT, it would be several thousand dollars. Um, our our framework runs you know uh, in the CLI command line. Um, and then we have a bra uh, graphical browser UI as well. Um, the whole thing is also uh, concurrent; has a concurrent support. So, uh, you know, we can we can the, the bottleneck is the LLM calls, um, and I'll walk through like why that's the bottleneck. But you know, um, um, these calls are 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 very expensive, and and our engine uh, for one step of of game time or or simulation time, um, depending on how many agents you have, is can go anywhere from thirty seconds to sixty seconds. Um, so, 
uh, concurrency was important for us. We 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 ran our uh, experiments on a really small cluster, but um, we also had access to uh, did did some tests on a larger cluster, and and concurrency was was super important. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to basically walk through the paper, and then I'll switch back and forth between some slides. But uh, uh, yeah, oh, and so I wanted to show you the screenshot here. So uh, this is from the paper, but this is an example of an agent, um, Victor. So he starts off with the goal of having no goal, and you know, so his thought is, as an agent walks through the simulation, um, the agent uh, will have will be primed to just have random thoughts. And so like the first initial thought was, hey, what should I do today? Uh, he runs into a stranger. Uh, you know, he changes his goal to explore the world. Um, he continues to see, the agent continues to see different uh, stimulus, perceive different things. Nothing changes here. Um, he, he runs into a friend and he decides to change his goal to hang out. And, and so they hang out and they go, they run into a, a mall. Um, later on, the same agent runs into uh, a zombie. One of the simulations we did was a zombie simulation, which I'll talk about, but runs to a zombie. Um, this would be considered a, you know, an important event. And so the agent uh, changes its goal, you know, it's got to stay safe. And so the next time it runs into a, a refrigerator, you know, it still has the same same goal of, hey, let me let me stay calm and, and be safe. And, and, and so now it wants to search the refrigerator. Uh, now it wants to, as it runs into a different, stimulus, you know, runs into a stranger, the agent wants to um, um, learn from that other agent, wants to, uh, goes into, it discovers a new room and wants to search it. Um, and so, yeah, you can see basically uh, this is these goal changes and, and thoughts and um, things they say are pulled directly from the simulation. You can see that uh, um, it's dynamically changing both its thoughts um, words it spoke it speaks and its goals based off of the the stimulus that happens in the environment. Um, you can look at this as basically as a reinforcement uh, learning loop. Um, you know, perceived um, uh, based off its mo model, do something and then um, and uh, calculate what to do and then and then run that action. Um, so, yeah, let me talk about the high level architect. So. This can really be thought of as a, um, you know, RAG, uh, retrieval augmented generation is something that um, a lot of people talk about when they're working with these, uh, with these uh, LLM models. LLMs uh, right now, they do not, they're not able to uh, take in a lot of uh, context, right? They have a limit, um, several pages. And there are a lot of papers coming out now where um, people are doing, you know, uh, I think, uh, um, Google had one where I, I can't remember a million tokens or something. I can't remember how large it is, but um, eventually the the length of uh, the context window will will problem will go away and, and we'll be able to put put in larger um, context. Um, but right now it's still kind of a problem. And so RAG, uh, you know, people are, are working on RAG systems where you can, uh, you know, uh, I don't know if the high level, if you know the high level of how RAG works, but, you know, essentially you can uh, feed in a, a query and that query gets converted to a vector, and then you have a vector database of, of documents. And uh, usually you use cosine simulate to find um, your query string. It will return all of the related documents or, or strings, and then put that um, as part of your context when you do an LLM query. So um, really what uh, the memory stream that uh, our, our agent's memory stream is essentially, you can think of it as a dynamic RAG system. Um, what happens is uh, every single perception that they have gets stored as a memory, uh, and the memory is just a you know it's a it's a the all the code is in Python, and so it's it's just a an array um, of the of the perception, which right now to feed it to the LM is a string, um, and the type of memory we have different types of memory such as uh, perce perceived, a thought, uh, etc., and uh, and so, yeah, so these memories are getting um, appended to the memory stream of an agent as it's as it's going through the environment. Um, and so every single time, though, that when the loop reaches, the perception reaches an agent, what happens is, uh, you know, that perception that they get is, is turned into a vector. We do rag against across its memory. We retrieve all the relevant memories. Uh, we also score the memories by recency. So... Um, 
Um, and uh, and then and then when was the last time it was accessed? So when when was the last time the memory was accessed? When was uh, uh, the the relevance of the uh, you know with the with the rag, and then um, the importance. So importance is calculated. Um, we use an LLM call for that as well. And so um, I can just show you in uh, in code for a second. But um, essentially, importance is is also an LLM call that says, given um, give a score of one to ten. Uh, you know, give me give me the uh, score of one to ten. Tell me how important this memory is. Um, and uh, I don't remember what the. Anyways, that's the prompt. It's it's basically tell me how important the memory is. Um, get it. And so yeah, so. Um, Couple notes what we did, what we learned when we found when we did this um, rag, our rag system. Um, oh, sorry. And so why is dynamic, right? And so because I was saying this, it's using a scoring, uh, scoring mechanism plus, plus uh, the memories that could keep getting appended, and every single time an action happens, a uh, perception happens, and the agent um, has to perceive the memories keep changing over time. On top of that, because the agent can. Um, have its own thoughts and thinking about the meta, its metacognition and like, how do I achieve my goal? Its memory stream is constantly changing. Um, and so, you know, that's why we call it like a, we think of it as like a dynamic rag system. Um, some of the things we found, I mean, we've done similar cosine similarity um, before. And uh, what we found though, uh, it really popped up in our, in our system here is that um, actually, you know, like a, if you look at a vector space, uh, um, when you're comparing objects in the in high dimensional space, uh, what what the model finds is similar, you know, um, actually does not mean semantically similar. And so we actually found quite quite often when when an agent, um, you know, let's say an agent, uh, a, sp a specific example, an agent ran into um, a room and saw a refrigerator. Right. Um, if later on the word refrigerator came up in a conversation. Um, you know, just because just because the keyword matched, we often found that um, you would not absolutely get the everything related to a uh, refrigerator back, um, because you know similarity in in that high dimensional vector embedding space does not mean the same thing as semantically similar. So um, there are other models, and we we uh, experimented a little bit this with in our paper. Like, how do you uh, can you get a better retrieval? And and I don't know if um, other people have, have implemented RAG, but when I did my uh, my research into RAG, um, I found that almost everyone was doing a, a cosine similarity, and and so you know they're going to run into these same problems. So that was a that was an interesting finding we had. Um, it's Jason, uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, Anya posed a question related to this, and so he said, "Is there any restrictions for any agent to change its goal?" Uh, we experimented with that quite a bit, and really, that's like the main piece of what we were trying to figure out. Uh, I'll I'll walk through like what some of the things we tried to do. Um, so first of all, we tried um, only giving allowing a single goal, and so meaning like you can only have one goal at a time. Um, in real life, though, you know, all of us have multiple competing goals. So, uh, you know, I want to give a talk on this paper. I want to do the paper. I want to, you know, I want to. Uh, Go traveling, you know, there's multiple goals we have. Um, so we then we expanded it. We allowed multiple goals. Um, we also added a piece that, uh, you know, the agent, as they go through the loop, um, we experimented with allowing the agent it, itself to decide to, um, we have a function called metacognize. And basically when it runs the metacognize function, it will evaluate how is my progress on the goal. And if the goal progress is low, we we say give it a score of one to ten. If your if my progress is low, um, which is below a five in our in our system, then it says okay, uh, pre please propose other um, solutions to improve my change my goal or how to uh, better achieve my goal. Um, so I don't know if that answered the question, but uh, we've been experimenting with quite a quite a bit, and you know the combination of, you know, uh, this LLMs being um, you know, you won't get the answer, same answer every single time. Uh, it's been it's been both fun and and tough to experiment with. Um, but yeah, I mean that that's literally the the core piece we've been experimenting with quite a bit is trying to figure out like what's the right balance. 
Um, as I kind of mentioned earlier, we want to make the whole, one of the future experiments we want to do is to be able to not just um, improve on a specific goal, but, you know, cover more, more of what people call metacognition, you know, um, uh, going to, going to some of these other areas, but for a, for a, a task oriented, you know, thinking about it for, um, what most people want to have when they think about agents and how to improve them, you know, there's a lot of companies trying to use agents to kind of do task oriented goals for, for task oriented goals. I think this is a, um, a very strong case for people to want to use these agents. Um, so yeah, like I said, I don't know if I answered that, but, but we spent quite a bit of time and we still continue to experiment on, on how to um, do this better, uh, metacognition better. Um, so sorry, where was I? Uh, let's go back to paper. Yeah, so at a high level, um, I mean, I kind of already explained it, but just, yeah, like I was saying, the loop almost looks like a reinforcement learning loop, um, but here's, here's what the agent's doing. Um, you know, they they have the ability to plan. They have the ability to um, to translate that plan into action. Um, they progressively monitor themselves. How am I doing? Uh, they score it. We and then and then we we based off that score we we evaluate and then and then have them do something else. Um, I'll just show you for a second. Here's a recorded video, but um, you know we, I have this running in real time as well. Um, this is our simulation environment. Uh, you can see it's very basic. Um, you know, we'd love to use something like, uh, what is it? NVIDIA's Omni, Omniverse, I think it's called. But uh, that requires probably a lot more computation. Um, but yeah, so in this simulation here, we, uh, we, want, we were testing a, a zombie world. And so basically if a bunch of agents are thrown into a world with a, a zombie apocalypse, can they survive it? And so, uh, well, the, the the summary is most of the time they end up dying, <laughs> um, which if, you see, if you've ever seen a movie, that seems to be the uh, what happens every single time. Um, but yeah, so this is the kind of environment we built out. Uh, we, we experimented with um, a lot of different scenarios. Uh, let me show you some of them. So yeah, zombie apocalypse. Um, we did a murder mystery where there's one there's one person that's a killer and one person that's a detective. And then there's 20 other agents that are just random people. And uh, we, we basically just watched what happened, but we, we also experimented with using different type of uh, um, objectives. Oh, and I, I kind of, I'm, I'm jumping all around a little bit, but each agent has the ability. Uh, well, we give them two things. We give them, um, we can start them off. I'll show you what the file looks like, but we have a, each agent starts with, uh, you can give them like a, their background. So here's their background um, a description. And then some of them start with a goal and some of them just don't have any goal. Um, so yeah, they get two things or three things, name, description, and goal. And then we can also, and then we also give them actions that they're allowed to run. Uh, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And so, sorry, back to here. So yeah, zombie apocalypse, a murder mystery, um, Secret Santa, which is uh, I don't know if you, any of you know this game. It's a it's a I think it's an American game, but essentially you you uh, it's a party where everyone knows everyone has a different person as their Secret Santa. Your goal is to find out what 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 they like so that you can give them a present, but you don't want them to know. And so this is this one was pretty interesting, but because it's an experiment of. Um, how they're how the agents are trying to lie to each other and trick each other, uh, not trick each other, but find out information without letting them know that they are the uh, the secret Santa. Um, so yeah, it was pretty interesting. We they were able to do that. Um, the murder mystery also was pretty interesting because, you know, there there's one agent who's trying to essentially hurt others without letting the other ones know, and then the other the remaining ones are trying to figure out who's doing it. Um, so that was pretty interesting. Um, yeah, we do find, we do find both that they, in all these experiments, we did get them to work, uh, all of them. Um, this one is another interesting one is just to watch, uh, you know, you have two competing candidates in an election. 
excuse me, sorry, in an election, and they try to uh, um, you know just win over the rest of the 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 town. Um, also, one thing I didn't mention: uh, the the amount of people uh, agents we run right now is around twenty five. Um, you can control obviously how many you want. Um, scaling wise, yeah, uh, I'll just talk about that for a minute, but it takes. Uh, for each agent we add, it's around three to five LLM calls per per agent per step. And so, you know, it grows, um, you know, linear, linearly as uh, as you add more agents. Um, but yeah, with it's it's near real time. We want to be able to run this in real time with our, our goal is 20, 20 agents in real time on a consumer card, like a 4090. Um, yeah, I, on, my, on my mini cluster, I have a 4090. Um, and you know, uh, we're not there yet to run it in real, real time, but we're, it's, it's close. Uh, we did quite a bit, a bit of experimentation trying to get this to run uh, faster. Um, you know, with, a with access to a real cluster, we would, it would go much faster. Um, we experimented, I mentioned, um, there are these tiny models like Phi. I don't know if you, that's a Microsoft model that supposedly it's, it's state of the art for, for a tiny model. Um, we found, uh, yeah, I mean, we had this, this. The slide's empty, but um, essentially we we definitely did what was called prompt engineering. We spent a lot of time. Um, I'll just walk you through like a couple of a couple of these uh, um, prompts we did. But uh, for example, uh, let's see, decision decide is actually this is this is a this is the main function. LLM call. Um, let me walk. Yeah. So for the LLM call, um, the main call that happens is on every single loop of the game, when it goes through each agent, the agent perceives, and then a function called the side is called. And what ha that happened, what that is, is like, given all my recent memories, given, given here's who I am, here's my context of the agent, here are my recent memories, here are the actions that are available. So not all, you know, agents have different actions. So, um, you know, for a zombie, all it can do is kill. Um, for, you know, um, some of the actions we have available are, are um, talk, go to a, dis a destination, um, attack, you know, like for the murder one, they're basically attacking. Um, and yeah, so so this is our, our prompt. Uh, oh, you're, it, so meta questions, um, this is basically, I was I was saying earlier that they have the when they run the metacognize function, uh, that's basically asking the questions about themselves. How am I doing? What do I need to take in consideration on keep achieving my goal? So these meta questions are injected into into um, how it's thinking, and uh, yeah, and so basically this whole prompt, which is you know when you when you do all the interpolation, maybe I don't know um, two hundred lines. It's quite long. And we found basically even for a single model changing in between models, versions, and then and then switching versions, the the results are completely different. And so we did do and initially we did quite a bit of experimentation on trying to figure out like what's the best trade off for, um, uh, you know, a, a high performing model versus versus uh, smaller model and faster. And so yeah, we ended up with Mistral, um, Llama two, you know. When we came out, I think Mistral, when we started writing this, Mistral just came out. Um, so we started off with Llama 2 um, because, like I said, we wanted to start with open models. Um, we did do some experimentation with ChatGPT, but only just kind of as a be as a baseline. Um, ChatGPT and, and, and sorry, GPT 3, 5, and 4 are actually great because almost all the prompts always worked. And so what we would do um, when we were experimenting, building out this engine, uh, you know, we if we couldn't get the prompt working for the models we were testing with here, we would go take the same prompt and test it, test our assumption in in ChatGPT three ChatGPT three five, and ninety I would say ninety five percent of the time it worked there. And so if it worked there, then we knew like, hey, the direction we're going is right. And so we would then fine tune the 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 prompt to to make it work. Um, Jason, uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, there's a two questions. So. One is uh, follow the uh, previous question uh, from Rodin. So he basically said, it's, uh, if I want my robot to clean the house, mm -hmm. and he decided he wanted to walk a dog, despite mm -hmm. uh, his uh, protect. 
you know, uh, what what do you do? Um, is the question like, would they do something different or? or... No, they're, they're basically, you want to, you know, you want the robots to clean the house. And then, you know, the robot doesn't want to clean the house. It want to walk the dog. And uh, even though you're saying no, what, yeah. what are you supposed to do? Yeah, in our system, um, we found the opposite problem. Um, you know, these these LLMs, uh, they're not really meant for, you know, they're trained off of pairs of of strings and text, right? Response, and then especially with these instructions, uh, you know, with the chat GPT, the big innovation there was like training data of instructions of, you know, uh, um, you know, uh, input and response versus just just predicting the next token. Um, and so we had the opposite problem, meaning they oftentimes followed it too rigidly. And and so I'll give you an example of that. So we we actually built quite a few unit tests into this thing. The only way we could quickly and reliably test it um, was with lots of lots of unit tests. And so uh, I'll give you a, an example here. Um, oh, sorry. Test. Test, test, uh, um, uh, I don't remember the name of the test actually. Uh, test, sorry, one second. Okay, test here. So I'll just show you this. So this is um, a real, a real test running in our system. Um, and I'll show you like a, a conversation that they have. Um, so um, I, I've, I've defined two agents here um, that are one, he says he loves physics and the other one loves art. And so I have them start conver um, having a conversation and uh, I was experimenting with pulling them off into sending them to a different direction. They would stick to it too much and so the problem was the conversations sometimes are not natural because they keep forcing it back to only talking about physics um you know victor here he loves physics and and natasha she's forcing the conversation to go to art and so um here's some of the like this basically shows here that we had the opposite problem is that we couldn't get them to um to deviate a little bit um they were like too strict in our problem in our in our scenario so, yeah, I mean, it is a problem. I would say that um, they're following it too strictly. And so we've we've implemented several things to kind of get around this, um, which uh, uh, I'll just, yeah, I'll give you a 10 second preview on that. But uh, um, I'm going to write a blog post about this. Essentially, uh, I'll show you this little script I wrote. So basically, uh, basically, you have uh, the uh, the other problems. It's not like agent, uh, you know, going to do something different, but... Uh agent is to follow the model too closely. It was uh, yes. kind of almost memorize the, the things. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Sorry, you said there was another question? Yeah, yeah, another question from Anya. Basically say, can user provide starting parameters and watch the experiments to play out? Yes, yes. I mean, that's exactly how the whole um, system is supposed to work. So um, in the config file I showed, I don't know if you still see my screen, but uh, you know, the zombie situation literally is just a JSON file of, of you know, um, here's the background. It's a world overrun by zombies. Um, you can you can give it a few agents. So like here, Natasha, she's great at foraging for supplies. Um, uh, Sherlock, you know, you could say, for example, Sherlock uh, doesn't care. You know, Sherlock wants to, wants to, he wants to be a cook or whatever. He wants to. You can you can give them any description and any goal, or you can leave them completely blank. Mm, so um, yes, but the problem uh, going back to that problem again though, what we were finding at least with with Mistral, we could we believe it with another model such as um, like if we were to use more ChatGPT three five, it it would probably be a little bit more looser. Um, we found that it was attaching too much to its goals, and so. Some of the experiments we're doing now is is to figure out how to not follow it so strongly, um, so that it it's a little bit more natural. Um, and yeah, and so I was I was about to mention this this uh, I'll show you this random experiment I did. So, if you ask a model to say, "Give me a random thought," um, 
you know, nine, we, we did experiments asking it and, and to give a response to that. So here's a, here's a, here's a, the text we did. Pretend your name is John. You just ate ice cream. Contemplate a random thought. Uh, you know, that's, that's the prompt. If you do that a thousand times, but we found 80% of the time it's going to be the exact same string. So, you know, it's uh, not being very stochastic is very acting, very deterministic. And, you know, that's expected. LLMs are not, you know, when they see the word random, they, it, it's still just going through, uh, there it's, you know, going through its, its model, selecting the neurons, um, and, and you're going to get almost the same result. So, uh, we found actually, we, we, we came up with a way to, uh, uh, initiate, to add randomization that doesn't affect the model, the, the output too well. So we, we added it to the beginning of the model, uh, sorry, of our prompt. We tested both with, um, prime your thoughts, uh, and we use random numbers and we also use random strings. And this, this made it shoot up dramatically. Um, just by adding this, you know, prime your thoughts with, with, um, a random number, but don't mention it, um, in your response. And this this uh, ninety percent of the results res uh, responses were random, so um, yeah, we're experimenting experimenting with this more. But yeah, this is what kind of the way we use to um, get it out of this other problem um, of uh, having the agent be too too strict or or following following its orders too well. Okay, thank you. Sorry, to interrupt your your presentation. So uh, maybe you can finish your presentation. Yeah. Um, no worries. Uh, I prefer more more questions, but uh, yeah. Uh, so where was I? Let's see. Um, yeah, this is just a high level kind of showing of how the memory module works. Um, uh, yeah, I don't have a, a screenshot of the of the memory framework itself, but as I mentioned, uh, what we do is. Uh, to retrieve those memories, you know, where it's dynamically retrieving memories based off of what the query is. I'm using RAG, uh, the recency, uh, the the importance score, um, which, uh, yeah, the importance is generated by, uh, the LLM actually does the importance itself. So what is the importance, <coughs> excuse me, what is the uh, importance of this memory? So, you know, if I see a door, maybe the score is a one. If I saw um, someone, a zombie just just attacks someone. The the, the score is going to go much higher. Um, let me let me go over one other area. Oh yeah, so the engine. Let me go over this for a little bit. So, um, yeah, our action system. So I mentioned each agent has different actions. The the standard actions we have is like, you know, they can move around, they can talk, they can metacognize. Those are the main ones, but um, we want to add more. And so we basically built like a driver system. Uh, to be able to do an action means you need to perceive parts of the world. So for example, to um, decide, uh, well, if you want to like move objects, we haven't, we have partial, we have a partial implementation of, of controlling objects. Right now it's just, hey, you notice an object and then you can query its status but we want to be able to move them and things. Um, to be able to do that, you need, you need to have a better perception. So right now, you know, if you if you think about this, it's like, it's sort of like a old school video game. Um, I don't know if you guys know what RPGs are, role-playing game. Um, I think there's actually quite a few when, when ChatGPT and all these older models came out, uh, or GPT-3, I think a lot of people were building um, like interfaces to RPGs. And really, yeah, I, I mean, basically you're building, we're building an interface to uh, a text. We're basically taking the world and converting that that perception data into a text representation that the, that the LLM can understand. And so, um, you know, for like, we have fine grain movement. So for example, if an agent gets near a, uh, a zombie, like right here, let's say this guy is right next to the zombie here. Um, we will feed in, uh, we will feed in like a, a, the bounding box around the agent. We convert the whole box around there into them and say, hey, uh, you know, you have a, a a zombie at your you know coordinate relative where you are. And so, um, yeah, I mean, we to be able to add these actions, more complicated actions, we have to 
uh, add more and more sophisticated um, uh, perception data into into our agents. And so basically our our action driver system, essentially we just, for each new action we add, um, we want to, we have to also uh, take in like a, uh, we build a driver with like, here's the, here's the perception data, here's how you parse it, here's, um, and then here's how you can um, do the action in the world. So uh, we, we built out like this action driver system we have a, our main class is called the matrix, which is represents the whole simulation. Um, there's agents um, and there's like a timeline class, which allows us to uh, generate, uh, that's our, our experiment. So it's a log, a JSON log of every, every single action, every single perception. Um, we use that log to both rerun experiments, to, to evaluate our experiments, um, to generate the, the GUI um, or the replays, um, we use the timeline to, to, to basically, you know, do all this experimentation and, and visual representation. Um, yeah. We need uh, to wrap up, I think about time. So I'll leave okay. a few minutes for, for people to ask questions. Yeah. So that's a high level of, of what I built. Um, yeah, we, we want to kind of, uh, we we did this, this initial version. We want to expand it out, and use cases right now is really um, really more on the fun side and seeing what the what what's possible with these models. But we would, you know, we're we do want to experiment um, using them in more kind of like B two B use cases. Like how could companies use them? Um, we're thinking about like uh, role playing situations. Um, uh, we also have this agent system so it runs a simulation but you can also control the agent on the command line uh, and use it as like a bot etc so yeah uh, we published a paper the code's all open source there's a page here about it um, and then here's my contact info if you want to contact me but yeah any, any questions? yeah thank you